It's not so hard to kill peace by assassinating political leaders. Uh, President John F. Kennedy wanted to make peace with the Soviet Union and to get out of Vietnam. He was assassinated, I think, probably in a coup and probably with U.S. government involvement, CIA involvement. We're not sure. But peacemakers get killed. And that actually stops peacemaking. It's amazing. Yes, individuals matter. You need individuals to sign agreements. And if they can get killed by their own side, you don't get peace. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 202. And this episode is with Jeffrey Sachs, who is a university professor at Columbia University, where he serves as the director of the Center for Sustainable Development. And before that, he taught at Harvard for 20 years. In addition to his work as an economist on the cutting edge of sustainable development, which includes work on changes related to extreme poverty, uh, climate change, and other national economic reforms, Jeff is an expert on geopolitics and international relations with particular expertise on Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, and other currently contentious areas throughout the world. So this episode is the second part in a, well, the second part of a two-part, three-part series on the conflict in Israel and Palestine. And Jeff's position is pretty resolutely sympathetic to the Palestinians, but his approach to the situation is based on pragmatic concerns above all else. So ideology does not stand in the way of that. And given some of the other conversations on the show covering this topic, what I think makes this one unique is Jeff's expertise on the geopolitical concerns surrounding these events, and then our focus on possible solutions to the conflict. So aside from those two broad issues, we also talk about allegations of anti-Semitism in American universities, allegations of genocide and apartheid. And then the assassination of JFK and whether the CIA is responsible for that, along with the legitimacy of other conspiracy theories, both of which topics are a first for the show. Jeff's latest best-selling book is The Ages of Globalization, and you can find a link to that in the description, along with a link to the Patreon if you would like to support the show get a link to an ad-free RSS feed, or receive some show notes. Comments, likes, subscribes, all of these things are tremendously appreciated, especially reviews if you're listening on Apple or Spotify. And now, without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Jeff. I don't want to focus on October 7th today, but something I find disconcerting in most commentary on Israel-Palestine is that it's almost all pretty one-sided and unqualified, whether it's pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. But your writing admits of all the complexities and, and that this isn't entirely a black and white issue. So just to start off, before we move on to larger questions about geopolitics and solutions, I was wondering how you feel about whether the October 7th attack and its and the Israeli response, to what extent they're justifiable? Well, I don't think anything uh, was justifiable, uh, either the October 7th attack or the Israeli response. I believe uh, that uh, we have a tragic situation uh, in which political solutions have been blocked for decades. Uh, and that uh, results in uh, innocent people being killed. Uh, and uh, it explains or accounts for the terrorism. Uh, it doesn't justify it. 
But on the other hand, uh, Israel's political intransigence is uh, unacceptable and intolerable. So we have a terrible situation uh, that has been blocked from real solutions for decades. And that's what we always need to focus on is how do we solve this problem rather than uh, how do we blame uh, others uh, for it. That is not the right way to approach this terrible crisis. Okay, well then jumping immediately into this questions of this question of solutions, you wrote in your testimony to the UN Security Council on November 20th of last year that the UN has the power to end the war in Israel and Palestine. And just for our listeners who aren't really familiar with the UN's powers, what makes you think that this is possible, just let alone practical? Well, the war and peace issues uh, are vested in the UN, and uh, in particular in the UN Security Council. The UN Security Council has uh, ample power. Uh, if there is an agreement within the UN Security Council, it can Im impose solutions, it can impose peacekeepers, uh, it can even uh, mobilize a military force, uh, it can use sanctions uh, to uh, uh, punish uh, one side or another that uh, doesn't comply with the UN uh, orders. Uh, and so the UN Security Council, by international law, by the UN Charter, has the ability to impose a solution. Uh, what blocks that, of course, is that there is not unanimity within the UN Security Council, and in particular, the United States defends uh, Israel uh, and uh, to this date does not press honestly for a solution. Right. So, yeah, given these limitations, I mean, so Hamas governs Palestine, Netanyahu governs Israel with a right-wing coalition, and you've pointed out that many Israelis oppose the two-state solution. Many Palestinians view Israel as entirely illegitimate and a colonialist settler enterprise. And then, of course, you have the entire geopolitical situation behind all of this. So w how then would the UN practically execute on these abilities vested in it to end the conflict? Well, since 1967, there has been uh, a broad consensus, uh, even including the United States, uh, on uh, many votes and many occasions that there should be two states living side by side in peace. Uh, and uh, since uh, Resolution 242, which was uh, in 1967 uh, onward, that two-state solution has been embedded in repeated UN Security Council and UN General Assembly votes. It is the international law. <laughs> and in fact, the UN Security Council several times has endorsed the two-state solution, uh, and it is also indicated that the two-state solution should be implemented on the 4th of June, 1967 borders. Uh, this, I think, is the proper outcome to this conflict, which is basically a 100 years conflict, not even just a 57-year conflict that dates back already to the Balfour Declaration and, and uh, its aftermath in the 1920s. To end this conflict, in my opinion, we should abide by decades of international law and I think also pragmatism. There are uh, two groups. Uh, they are uh, um, irreconcilable in terms of their own negotiations, but uh, they can be pressed, uh, actually forced to live side by side in peace by the world community. Uh, and that's what I personally recommend uh, doing. I'd like to read a, a couple of sentences from an article you just published with Sybil Fairs in Common Dreams. And then I have a couple of questions about it. The two-state solution is enshrined in international law and is the only viable path to a long-lasting peace. All other solutions, a continuation of Israel's apartheid regime, one binational state or one unitary state, 
would guarantee a continuation of war by one side or the other or both, yet the two-state solution seems irretrievably blocked. And the first thing that I wanted to ask about this, because I, I've spoken with uh, five other people at this point on the show about Israel and Palestine, including people on the far Palestinian side, so Norman Finkelstein, and then all the way over to Benny Morris. And I've asked pretty much everybody about the allegations of Israel being an apartheid state, and I've gotten a range of answers. So I wonder how you think of whether or not Israel is an apartheid regime and on what basis? Well, I think it clearly is an apartheid regime right now. It occupies uh, Palestinian territory uh, and rules over millions of Palestinians uh, and often in a very brutal way. So to my mind, that is an apartheid regime. And uh, I would add that many in Israel, uh, in the government, want that to be a permanent feature. Uh, so even more so, that makes it an apartheid regime. The greater Israel idea, uh, if it isn't uh, brought about by ethnic cleansing uh, or by uh, something worse, uh, genocide, um, means apartheid, in effect. Since you've brought up uh, genocide, and I'm not sure whether it was the international court, I don't remember what it was called. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? You've cited this? Well, the International Court of Justice, you mean? Yes, the International yes. Court of Justice, yes. they said that Israel may be committing genocide, but they haven't yet made a definitive statement. I'm wondering where you weigh in on these allegations of genocide as well. Well, my uh, view is that the International Court of Justice is likely to find that Israel has committed genocide according to the terms of the 1948 Genocide Convention. Uh, genocide is uh, both a, a, a practical judgment used in common parlance, uh, and it's also a, a legal uh, uh, decision or criterion uh, based on whether a state is violating the Genocide Convention. So from a legal point of view, uh, this is uh, going to be decided by the International Court of Justice. There was recently uh, a report by Special Rapporteur of the Human Rights uh, Council of the UN uh, that uh, held that Israel was uh, in violation of the Genocide Convention. That's not a legal decision. It, it is uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, expert opinion of a special rapporteur. Uh, I'm not a jurist in this, though I've studied the Genocide Convention and episodes of genocide and some of the legal conditions. And my view is that the International Court of Justice is likely to find that Israel has committed genocide. One thing that's interesting to me about this is that, are you familiar with the historian Norman Neymark? He's here at Stanford. He's done a lot of work on Ukraine and Russia, but Another of his focuses is genocide, and we did a, a two or three hour episode all about the world. No, history. I, I don't know his work, unfortunately. Yeah, all about the world history of genocide. And it does seem to me qu like qu a quite different case from something like the Holocaust or the Armenian genocide or some of the many communist genocides, in that this isn't an overt case of just point blank extermination, like with the concentration camps in the Holocaust. And it does seem more like they just want the Palestinians to leave. Like the perfect situation for Israel would be Egypt opening up its uh, border on Gaza and taking the Palestinians out. But what, what makes it genocide, if not in your view, then based on the conventions when you don't have this 
these overt acts of extermination, because clearly Israel has the military force to just wipe out all of Palestine if it's so desired. Well, it's doing so right now. It's uh, right now uh, has killed uh, an estimated uh, 33,000 people to date, uh, and it is starving to death hundreds of thousands of people right now. That's pretty uh, shocking. And I think, again, from a, a legal point of view, uh, I found the uh, uh, assertions uh, made by the government of South Africa to be compelling. And um, they described uh, all of the specifics uh, in terms of intent and action uh, as uh, why they argue that Israel is violating the Genocide Convention. Um, similarly, the special rapporteur found the same. So uh, again, I'm not a legal specialist in this, but I found both the South African complaint and the report of the special rapporteur uh, to be, uh, unfortunately, uh, very convincing. I find the actions of Israel to be horrific and uh, without uh, the slightest of justifications. Uh, so um, I'm just uh, shocked and dismayed by uh, a government that is uh, willfully starving hundreds of thousands of people. Um, we see the emaciated kids uh, showing up and dying in the hospitals now, and I'm shocked of daily bombings uh, that have killed more than 30,000 people, of whom uh, 70% uh, are women and children, uh, and I've watched, unfortunately, because it's very painful, <clears throat> many, many tapes of uh, Israelis, uh, IDF forces, the Israeli Defense Forces, blowing up uh, universities, schools, mosques, apartment buildings uh, in uh, Gaza. I find it all totally abhorrent uh, and totally unjustified. So granted that obviously the continuation of an apartheid regime is not the solution that you want to see. And also given that the two state solution is the one that's in, enshrined in international law, what are the problems with the, and I'm, I'm looking again to that quotation from the article with civil fairs, the two other possible solutions that you mentioned are one by national state or one unitary state. And what is, I guess there are probably problems with just implementation and then one, and then on the other hand, whether or not these would function well or survive. But so what are the problems with these two solutions that lead you to really endorse the two-state solution? Well, I have no problem personally with either of the other two solutions. Okay. Uh, I just think that uh, the people on the ground uh, are violently opposed to, to both of them even more than uh uh, th then uh, the two-state solution, and as a pragmatic matter, the two-state solution for more than uh, 50 years uh, has been enshrined in international law, and I'm personally trying to find a pragmatic way to stop the killing and uh, end the uh, uh, and and end the the war and the violence and uh, the suffering. And my guess is that the uh, one state or binational solution, they're similar, uh, it's almost verbiage, uh, but uh, either way um, requires a, a modicum of trust uh, in society that doesn't exist right now. So I'm not basing the two-state solution on the idea of Israel and Palestine agreeing to it. I'm recommending that it be imposed and that the two sides uh, be kept away from each other, essentially, for as long as it takes for normal humanity to reappear and uh, recreate uh, levels of basic trust. 
So as a pragmatic matter, I think the two-state solution uh, fits uh, what can be imposed, whereas the one-state uh, or binational solution could not be imposed right now. I'll, re- I'll return to the practical pathway in a moment, but returning to where I began our conversation, one of the things that I find very troubling about a lot of these interviews is that so many commentators are totally one-sided and they almost, I mean, I haven't spoken to anybody who approaches the issue from religious grounds, but it's almost as if they are taking up a standpoint where Israel gets the land because it's God's will or on the other, from the other side, the Palestinians deserve the land for religious reasons. So I appreciate very much the pragmatic perspective and using that as a justification for endorsing the two state solution. But there, there's one other, well, speaking of the, the pathway towards this two state solution, I want to return to another quotation that I pulled from this article with Sybil Fairs. And you, you two write that the usual recommendation is the following six step sequence of events. One, ceasefire. Two, release of hostages. Three, humanitarian assistance. Four, reconstruction. Five, peace conference for negotiations between Israel and Palestine. And finally, six, establishment of two states on agreed boundaries. This path is impossible. And this leads me to ask why this has been the the pathway for the past 50 plus years and why it's failed. So we need to look for an alternative. Well, uh, it's been the pathway uh, in part because it's plausible that two sides uh, in a dispute should negotiate with each other. Um, one could be uh, cynical with justification and say that it's been the pathway because it's allowed the more powerful side, which has been Israel, to uh, prevaricate and delay. Uh, so either way, whether you take it straightforwardly, that there were negotiations, that they operated, but they didn't succeed, or that uh, it's been a sham, uh, and all along Israel has uh, really been angling to uh, keep everything Um you could argue either position, uh, and either position is potentially defensible, but I would say it doesn't work because uh, at a minimum, there are spoilers on both sides that are basically uh, able to block uh, an agreement, even if there were to be good faith on both sides. Uh, So one could debate, and it is debated every day. Has there been good faith? Did the Palestinians give up what was offered? Did Israel make a good faith offer? I don't even think it's truly that valuable to dissect every moment of Camp David or Oslo and so forth. Uh, The fact of the matter is uh, these negotiations have not worked. And I think what is plausibly uh, self-evident, or almost self-evident, nothing self-evident in this, but what I would say is uh, close to self-evident is that um, it's dangerous for politicians on either side uh, to uh, make compromises given that there are significant parts uh, on each side that are uncompromising. And I think the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin is probably uh, the main bellwether of this there you had a popular uh israeli leader who wanted to make peace and he was killed uh not by a palestinian but by an israeli uh, and he was killed because he wanted to compromise i think that that for me is uh, perhaps the literal reason why uh there's no outcome of these negotiations but it's also in a way the metaphorical reason as well, which is that uh, each side uh, has its spoilers who want everything, uh, and uh, for whatever reason, they can't agree. You could say metaphorically uh, that Ehud Barak in 2000 at Camp David said, I can't do more because of my opposition that I face. You have to 
understand my political uh, barriers, whether he was being tactical or right or a coward or telling the truth. Well, Yasser Arafat had the same kinds of barriers on his side. And uh, however one interprets these events, uh, say the breakdown at Camp David, you could say it's uh, Clinton's sloppiness. I happen to put that in a high <laughs> proportion of explanation. You could say it was that Barack was uh, not honest in following through. You could say that Yasser Arafat missed an opportunity. However one wants to interpret it, my view is that uh, the two sides have been unable uh, and perhaps unwilling, but at least unable to achieve uh, a, an agreement because of the nature of views on each side. Hmm. Yeah, the, no, this is tremendously fascinating here. It isn't just a geopolitical war or a war between two monolithic peoples, which of course it is, but it's a war between individuals and, and personal stakes play a huge role in actual events. So Look, it's, dangerous. it's so important to understand, by the way, it's not so hard to kill peace by assassinating political leaders. Uh, President John F. Kennedy wanted to make peace with the Soviet Union and to get out of Vietnam. He was assassinated, I think, probably in a coup and probably with U.S. government involvement, CIA involvement. We're not sure. But peacemakers get killed. And that actually stops peacemaking. It's amazing. Yes, individuals matter. You need individuals to sign agreements. And if they can get killed by their own side, you don't get peace. Mm. This is a, a slight digression, but I know that you've written a, a book on JFK. Does this question of his assassination uh, for these reasons enter into the book? It didn't uh, because I was not steeped in the assassination literature uh, during the last 10 years since I got asked nonstop about that, I became more and more uh, aware of the arguments and the debates and have come to believe more and more that uh, it was either rogue CIA or actual CIA, but uh, government complicity uh, in the assassination as the most likely explanation. Mm. Yeah, the the reason that I, I just think it's worth flagging is this is one quote unquote conspiracy theory, or it was once a conspiracy theory, same with, for instance, the the lab leak theory about COVID. And it's refreshing and I think very important to hear such an influential scholar not necessarily endorse them, but give them some level of credence and say they're worth investigating. Yeah, but I think it's really important to understand that there are lots of conspiracies. Conspiracy means a, a group of people get together to commit a crime, to violate international law. This is pervasive. Uh, the idea that conspiracy theory is somehow per se on the fringe or ludicrous is a wrong understanding. Uh, our government commits conspiracies all the time. We violate international law all the time. And every time we do, it's a conspiracy <laughs> per se, because it's not the action of one person. It's the action of a group of people who are violating international law. Now, who peddles in the idea that conspiracy theorists or believers in conspiracy theory are nuts well, people who commit conspiracies. Uh, the U.S. government wants us to believe that if you believe in a conspiracy, you're on the fringe or over the fringe. But the U.S. government patently commits conspiracies all the time. What do you think the CIA does for a living in its operation side? It overthrows governments. It tries to overthrow governments. Those are conspiracies. That's not, that's not fringe, that's core. <laughs> so the whole argument, uh, oh, that's a conspiracy theory, put that, let's put that aside. It doesn't mean everyone that comes up with something 
is speaking sensibly or knowledgeably, it is by nature tricky to understand conspiracies because they aim to be hidden. So it requires somebody telling you something interesting in an interesting way, or Julian Assange uh, revealing something in an interesting way, or a whistleblower leaking something in an interesting way, or somebody making a deathbed confession, or trying to follow uh, the, uh, you know, connect the dots with the danger that, of course, there's deliberate misdirection by those who would commit a conspiracy. But the idea that somehow it's just weird or strange to believe in a conspiracy misses the point. There's an excellent book, uh, by the way, very, very nicely done uh, by Lindsay O'Rourke, uh, written in 2018, published in 2018, uh, called uh, Covert Regime Change. And it documents in a serious way, it was her dissertation at University of Chicago under the direction of John Mearsheimer. It documents 64 cases of covert U.S. regime change operations. Some failed, some succeeded in their own terms of overthrowing the government. Every one of those is a conspiracy. And that's not some crazy idea. That's the documented record. So we should understand the issue is not whether you believe in conspiracies or not. If you don't, you're missing the point. The question is which ones you believe in. Right. Is there evidence for it? Is it just craziness? Is it just your ideology? Is it some kind of self-serving weirdness or is it evidence-based? And with evidence, you have to understand that it is in the nature of conspiracy to hide, to dissimulate, to misdirect, to peddle false information. And so to get this right requires a lot of uh, homework. But believe me, there are conspiracies uh, and uh, they're not so uncommon. Right. And I think the the disingenuous rhetorical move here is to play on the association with conspiracy theories to flat earth or or space is fake in order to discredit something that's that's exactly right that may be legitimate that's like, exactly right flat earth is not a, a conspiracy theory it, it is a, a an incorrect uh, scientific proposition that's completely different right exactly because of course there as you just said there is a very substantive difference in kind between these sorts of cases where you have government operations on the one hand and space is fake on on the other but okay no this has been tremendously interesting but returning though to this realization or acceptance that this is not just a war between monolithic powers but between people and you mentioned this is tremendously dangerous politically you referenced the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. But who are the main personal spoilers then on each side that people should be keeping in mind? And where, what are their stakes in this conflict? Well, first of all, if you take uh, Israel, it, it is a coalition government. And some of the parties in the coalition have as their express purpose and platform greater Israel. Greater Israel in this context means that Israel keeps control of all of the land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean from the river to the sea. That's uh, usually attributed as a Palestinian slogan, but it's uh, basically the platform of a number of the parties in the current Israeli government, and not in a hidden way, in a very explicit way. Uh, often, by the way, with some of these uh, parties, which I regard as extremist parties, based on uh, biblical interpretation. So this is uh, literally, as, as you earlier mentioned, people who say God gave uh, the Jewish people this land, uh, and so it is a commandment or a mitzvah uh, to uh, keep all of the land. And there are uh, important political forces in Israel that believe that. Probably the two most recognized uh, <coughs> leaders of that are uh, Smotrich and Ben Gavir, who are two senior cabinet ministers in 
the current Israeli government. They explicitly uh, believe that Israel should keep all the land and either rule over the Palestinians or that the Palestinians should be invited or forced to leave. Uh, So that's their view. That's important because even though they're not the dominant, uh, I'd say, uh, representation of attitudes in Israel, they are uh, pillars of this coalition government, and they are swing votes in power. Uh, So they have a lot of influence, and their position is uh, intransigent. I would characterize it as religious nationalism or religious extremism. Uh, And uh, it also expresses the will of hundreds of thousands of Israeli settlers living in illegal uh, settlements in the West Bank. Uh, Now, some of those settlers are religious zealots. Uh, Others uh, want a swimming pool and uh, low-cost land. Uh, But uh, the UN Security Council was very clear in 2016, uh, they are living there illegally. Uh, this is these are illegal settlements, and this part of the government represents them. There's another part of Israeli society which says we need to do what we need to do for security. It's not about what God gave us. It's that there's no one uh, to talk to on the other side. They just want to kill us. That's a not a small part of Israeli society. I think it's wrong substantively in many, many ways, uh, thinking that the only way to live is by making war or dominating the other, because there are other ways to have security. But that's another view. Then there's only a small part of Israeli society today that openly calls for the two-state solution. So I'd say that there are different views. They've shifted over time. Uh, probably a pretty significant part of Israel, Israeli society, would abide by the two-state solution if they felt it was safe. And a much smaller part would object to the two-state solution on religious grounds alone. These are shifting patterns after October 7. The fear factor, the idea that there's no one to talk to on the other side, that Hamas is out to kill us, many ideas became even uh, more prevalent in Israeli society, something like what happened in the United States uh, vis-a-vis Islam and vis-a-vis the Middle East after 9-11 is similar. Um, But it's important to understand that there are these uh, differences of view. Uh, On the Palestinian side, there are also differences of view. Uh, There are those who say that everything about Israel is illegitimate, unacceptable, and reversible, that there should be no state of Israel, period. There are others that say it is what it is, whether we like it or don't like it, but we want to live in our own country, and we want peace, and we want Israelis to stop killing our kids occupying our homes, stealing our land, uh, oppressing us for where we move, and all the rest. That's not a small part of Palestinian society. Uh, Then there are views, by the way, very important throughout uh, the Arab region. Uh, And the Arab region has said very clearly since uh, 2002, and it repeated all of this in Uh, the months since and weeks since uh, October 7, that what they want is a two-state solution on the 4th of June 1967 borders, and with that would come a state of peace. That's important because that includes Egypt, it includes Jordan, it includes the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, it includes the United Arab Emirates. Now, what's also extremely important is that beyond the Arab Peace Initiative, in 2002 is an Arab and Islamic declaration that came in Riyadh in November of uh, 2023 
that said we all accept the Palestinian pe- uh, the uh, Arab Peace Initiative of 2002. That included Iran, because it's my view and belief that Iran also will subscribe to the two-state solution and wants peace. So people may dispute that. I live uh, in a world uh, of diplomats. Uh, I believe in and work in the United Nations. And I believe that uh, Iran is not implacably opposed to the two-state solution and said so. I also believe very much in talking with others and listening to what they actually say, not putting words and ideas in their mouths. What we do in the world right now is to say, oh, they don't believe that. And you say, well, they actually did say that. No, no, they don't believe that. Well, how do you know? Well, I know they don't believe that. Uh, This is uh, partly a game and partly uh, a... uh, low level of intelligence, I'm sorry to say. If you want to know what others believe, you talk to them. You don't trust every word. I I do often quote Ronald Reagan, who said, trust but verify. Uh, When you make agreements, uh, you make them with stipulations, with monitoring, with verification, uh, and so forth. But the fact of the matter is, Iran has said they sign on to the Arab Peace Initiative. That's very important. Why don't we talk with the Iranians as a result? That's extremely important. But in a more recent article, I wrote, we don't have any diplomacy anymore. This government doesn't talk to anybody except its allies, allies and friends, allies and friends, allies and friends. But, you know, it was actually Shimon Peres who used to say, you don't make peace with your friends, you make peace with your enemies. Uh, And uh, this is actually a smart observation. One element of this conflict that has not come up in any of these conversations I've had is the geopolitical situation. And I can think of nobody on the planet better to ask than you about how three particular characters relate to this war. And those are Biden, Putin, and Jinping. So what role and what stakes do they have in this conflict and how are they shaping it or not shaping it? In my view and my understanding, this is one of those issues in which there is no difference of interest of the major powers. I see no reason why this issue in any way hits the U.S. against Russia or against China. Uh, Neither Russia nor China is anti-Israel or rejectionist in the sense of wanting to destroy Israel or end Israel. Uh, What both Russia and China have said repeatedly, actually for decades, is they want peace in the Middle East and they're supporters of the two-state solution. So this is one of those cases. It's not like this on every issue, but this is one of those cases where I see no no great power difference. This is not an area where we're doing something because we have to resist Russia uh, or resist China. This is an area where the U.S., Russia, China, U.K., and France, the five permanent members, could readily sit down and say, you know, we basically share an interest in the world not blowing up and then ending this slaughter. So let's get on with it. And that's what I would like to see. So I, I can agree with you that, of course, nobody wants to see the, the world get blown up because of this. But th- this uh, gut reaction probably just emerges from my ignorance about the geopolitical situation. But I would assume that because control and influence in the Middle East is so important geopolitically that if the United States has backed Israel because that gives them an important foothold in the Middle East, China and Russia, China and Russia would de facto 
wish to back the Arab side to combat American influence there. But is that not the case? It's not not really the case so much uh, because uh, there are hundreds of thousands of Russians in Israel, for instance, Russian Jews, uh, that maintain uh, an active relationship with Russia. Russia actually has very normal, good relations with Israel. Uh, Same with China. It's, It's actually not choosing sides. Uh, and I think this idea, by the way, that, uh, you know, uh, that Israel is uh, a beachhead for the United States in the Middle East uh, or on our side in the Middle East is, is uh, so wrongheaded. Yeah. Uh, we should have good relations with the Arab world. I believe we could have absolutely normal relations with Iran as well. It's a very sophisticated country. Uh, It's got uh, sophisticated governance that uh, stretches back 2,500 years. Uh, So they could teach a thing or two to the United States as well. Uh, So I don't find the idea that, well, Israel is ours to have uh, make any sense, but still less... uh, the fact that we should defend Israel as it commits a genocide, I don't see uh, e- e- even an iota of the geopolitical reasoning that could justify that. All that's happening right now, aside from the slaughter itself, is that the United States has become almost completely isolated diplomatically. Uh, and when I travel around the world, uh, the rest of the world is aghast at the fact that the United States continues every day to provide the bombs for Israel's massacres of the Gazans. Well, Jeff, the last thing that I'd like to ask today, because I know you've written about it recently, is what your thoughts are today about the alleged anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, perhaps, in the administration of American universities and the relationship between them and their donors in Congress. And I know you're kind of at ground yeah. zero at Columbia on this issue. Well, I mean, my uh, view is very straightforward, which is that uh, students are protesting a slaughter that's taking place before their eyes. Uh, and uh, they should be doing so, after all. I, what we're watching is horrible. It needs to stop, period. Uh, and so when students protest against that, I think that it is uh, uh, not only their right, obviously, but I think they are in the right to protest an ongoing massacre and to watch uh, quietly if uh, Israel is actively starving hundreds of thousands of people is just a horrific idea. So I would like our universities to do what we should be doing. Uh, and that is uh, lots of workshops and seminars and lectures and studying these questions, discussing, debating. That's the great strength of universities. Uh, I have uh, many uh, colleagues at Columbia University that know a lot about this uh, ongoing crisis, uh, and uh, I've learned a lot from them. And what universities should be doing is saying, Whatever shouting is going on uh, throughout society, we are an institution of learning, of scholarship, of debate, of investigation, uh, of interchange, of dialogue. And I would like to see a lot more learning. By the way, that's not to say learning over the next 10 years, we need it day by day because this is an emergency. But we should be having teach-ins, workshops, seminars, lectures, debates, uh, and we should uh, have the uh, gumption to do it in a very peaceful and, and uh, civilized manner so that we actually make headway in understanding these issues. My own view is uh, to understand them is also to understand the path to uh, a quick end to this uh, disaster and a path to peace. Well, on that note, Jeff, I mean, thank you so much for the conversation. It's been a tremendous pleasure to have you on the show. Well, thank you. I'm absolutely delighted to speak with you. Thanks for inviting me. 